Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8. And shall we stand in honor of God's word? The message this morning is more than conquerors. Let's stand in honor of God's word. More than conquerors. Romans 8, verse 31. The word of the Lord. What then shall we say in response to this? If God is for us, who can be against us? What then shall we say in response to this? And repeat that part together with me. If God is for us, who can be against us? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Lord, remind us of this incredible truth in Scripture. If God is for us, who can be against us? We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Whatever may come, the good and the bad, thanksgiving or mourning, something new or something that has grown very old, you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. And you are faithful. And if you're for us, who can be against us? We pray you anoint the preaching of the word. We pray that Christ Jesus may be seen. You'll strengthen our hearts by faith. We can leave this place and go out and serve you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. More than conquerors. Often in Scripture, the Bible uses metaphors for light and dark. And darkness, the metaphor in the Bible often means a darkness where God is not present or God is not near. And I'm lost, I'm wandering, I'm away from God. And then the metaphor of light in the Bible represents when God breaks in, when God comes near, when God turns my darkness into light. The Bible says in Isaiah 9 verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. I know that you can think in your life of when you were in darkness without Christ in your life, wandering and roaming around, making many mistakes, amen, amen. and sinning and lost <laughs> in darkness. But then when the light came on, when the light shone into our hearts, Christ opened up our spiritual vision so now we could see like we had never seen before. Amen? Amen? And as He moved in our life, He gave us the great gift of salvation. I hope you're writing notes this morning. If you are, write this down. God is for us because He wants to save us. God is for us and He wants to save us. What does He save us from? What is that darkness? Well, we know it's sin, isn't it? He saves us out of sin. Sin is when we do life our way and we say, I don't care about you, God. This is how I'm going to live. This is going to be my decision. And we go out and we do things that go against God's will and God's law. And we know that they are wrong. Or sin can be the good that we are called to do and we do not do that. And we know that's wrong and that's sin. The Bible tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There's no one here today in the service that has not sinned. We don't come to church to show how good we are. As a matter of fact, we come to church to lay our goodness down so that Christ's goodness can happen in us. And I remind you that when the Bible says, if God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us because He wants to save us. Jesus came to save His people from their sins. Christ desires to save the entire world. Jesus Himself made a claim. His claim was, He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through Me. That's not a Nazarene claim. That's not a Baptist claim. That's not a Presbyterian claim. That's the claim that Jesus makes. 
He says, I am the hope of the world. I have come to save the world. That's why we share in Holy Communion, because we know that only through the blood and body and sacrifice of Christ, who hung and died on the cross, are we saved. Amen? That's why the cross stands in the very center of this church, and a church that is a Christian church, because Christ is the very center. He hung and He died so that we might have life. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us, and He wants to save us. His heart, His desire, He is not willing that any should perish. When people say, how could a good God send people to hell? God's heart, He showed it by giving His Son, Jesus Christ. His heart is to bring people unto Himself. That's the desire of His heart. He loves people. And He cares about people all over the world. As we celebrate Thanksgiving, we are reminded of all the blessings that we have. And in this nation that we live in, we are most blessed. Amen? God has been so good to us. But God isn't just American. God looks all over the world and has His arms wide open all over the world. The Bible gives some very radical statements that God also doesn't have a caste system. It says, for when you come to Christ, there is no male or female. There is no slave or free, rich or poor. It's all a solid, equal ground as we stand before the Lord Jesus Christ. He's not biased. God loves the world and He desires to save the world. If you agree, say amen. amen. If God is for us, who can be against us? God is for us and He desires to save us. Do you remember in your own life when the Lord was dealing with your life and your heart? And was speaking to you about his great salvation. I heard the story of Christ Jesus dying on the cross from the time I was a baby growing up. That was so much of my life, but it came very clear to me one Sunday night in a service at church, and I heard the gospel that Jesus Christ died for me, that I was a sinner and lost away from Christ, and I knew the things I'd done wrong, and I knew I needed a Savior, and Christ came so that I might live, and gave Himself, took my punishment on the cross, because the Bible says the wages of sin is death, and I found out that Christ took my punishment, because God is a God, He's not a God of nominal justice, He's a God of, of, of pure, strict justice. Amen. You say strict. I don't mean strict as, as mean or mean-spirited. I mean that His justice is perfect. There's no deviation in His justice. And He saw when His Son died on the cross, He saw what His Son did, and that was pleasing to Him. And as we turn to Christ and ask Him to forgive our sins and place our faith in Jesus Christ alone and ask Him to forgive and come into our life, He forgives us. He forgets the Bible says He cast our sins away from us as far as the east is from the west. He forgives and forgets and heals and cleanses and purifies and saves us. Amen. Never get away from the day that Christ saved you. Always remember that. Always hold that in your heart. If God is for us, then He wants to save us. God is here today in spirit through Jesus Christ. His Holy Spirit is here. And He's talking to you about Jesus. It's not about a church. It's not about a certain religion or church or the name over the door. Amen? It's about the Lord Jesus Christ. What will you do with Jesus Christ? This Christmas season, this Advent season, will you refuse Him? Will you allow Him to come into your life and save you? And listen, He can save to the maximum. He can go to all sides of the track and all places. He can go to the very richest to the poorest. He can go to that one that is trapped in such obsessive sin that everybody else has cast away hope, but Christ never gives up hope. He loves to the uttermost and saves to the uttermost. And I'm reminding you this morning that if God be for us, He is offering His gift of salvation. You can leave here today you can go to a bookstore and find a self-help book. You can find ways to live right. 
You can connect with a medium. You can go through various forms of religion and various ideas and Buddhism and Islam and various religions. Christ made the claim. He himself said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Yes. If we think we know more than that, then we know more than Jesus Christ. And I say to you that Christ loves you. He gave himself on the cross for you. If God be for us, He wants to save you. Amen? Amen? Secondly, if God is for us, He wants to sanctify you. If God is for us, He wants to set us apart. You see, Jesus Christ died so that our sins may be forgiven. But He didn't stop there. His death on the cross and God sending His Son, which you see in verse 32 there, God sending His Son, He did this so that we would give ourselves to Him. He gave Himself to us, and now we give ourselves to Him, holding nothing back. No doubt there's someone here this morning. I know God is for them, but they've not given their self to Him. They love Him. They've asked Him to forgive their sins. But Christ is waiting and saying, will you give yourself now to me as a living sacrifice? Will you lay your life on the altar to me? Will you consecrate yourself to me so that I can take not only the sin away, but I can take what it was that caused you to sin and purify that and sanctify you and set you apart? Pastor, can God do that in people? Isn't it such that that God just forgives our sins and then we go out and sin again and He forgives our sins and we sin again and He forgives our sins and we sin again. The Apostle Paul said in the same chapter, Romans 8, forbid it, that's not what God planned. Thanks be to God, we have victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And if God before us, He came to sanctify us. Sanctify means to set us apart for His service and His glory and His honor. This morning, I encourage you. God is for you. And He wants to sanctify your heart. You may be a Christian that says, I love the Lord. He wants you to love Him with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And if you're holding something back, it is not worth it. Amen? Nothing that you're holding back is worth what Christ can do and wants to do in your life. If God is for you, and He is, He wants to sanctify you. He wants to set you apart. Notice in the Advent meet here, we have the candle that is burning. Light in the Bible represents God doing something amazing. Remember the people that were in Egypt in 430 years that they were in slavery. Listen, God hates slavery. God wants to set people free. Throughout the history of our world, women have been enslaved. God doesn't want women enslaved. Women are not subordinate to less than a man. God created them male and female in His image. Amen? And God wants to set women free. People that are caught in global trafficking and the global sex trade, people that are caught in hunger and famine, God wants to save them, but He also wants to take those entities, whether it be a church, whether it be a place, whether it be a nation, and He wants to bring that to Himself and transform it into His character. And surely that is what happened early as America rose up out of dominance under another country. God did a beautiful work in this nation and made a place called America. One nation under God. God desires to save because He's for you. He wants to save you. He's got your number. He knows your name. Well, I can hide from Him. You cannot. I can hide. I can get away from Him. You cannot. Go to Psalm 139. It says, If I make my bed in the depths of the sea, even there, you see me. God sees your unformed body before you were ever made. That means whatever staging process was happening, 
God saw you before you were ever in your mother's womb. He desires to save you. The scripture says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And I will also say that when God saves us, He saves us to the absolute best. It's amazing what He can do. But He wants to sanctify us. He wants us to give ourselves to Him without reserve. What a beautiful season of Advent. Allow Christ to break into your life. And if you haven't given your whole self to Him, holding something back. And sanctification isn't just our part of giving. God sees your gift, your life. He sees that and He takes that and purifies us and reshapes us and makes us. And takes the inner spring in terms of a watch, the mainspring. And changes the mainspring so that now it beats its heart for God instead of getting away from God. God wants to sanctify us. If God is for us, He wants to sanctify us. Number three, God is for you and He wants to bless you. God is for you and He wants to bless you. Matthew chapter 7. We've been reading this Sermon on the Mount, studying this on Wednesday night. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, says this. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Now listen to this passage, especially you parents that are here, grandparents that are here, maybe some great-grandparents that are giving out some gifts at Christmas, and you kids that are here that can't wait to give gifts to your parents. That's going to be real good. <laughs> listen to what the Bible says about gifts and God's blessing. Matthew 7, verse 9. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, we'll give him a snake. If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? How much more? If you know how to give good gifts to your children, and you desire that on Christmas morning they absolutely love what you've given to them. How much more your heavenly Father desires to give good gifts to you. God is for you and He wants to bless you. Some would maybe misconstrue this to mean that all God cares about is blessing you financially. Oh, I want gold and silver and Nice things. The greatest gifts that God has to offer are so great that when the Bible talks about heaven, it talks about gold being what we step on, what the streets are made of, because that is so low compared to the gifts that God gives. When you think of the gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians 13, faith, hope, and love. And the greatest of these being love. When you think of God's gift, His gifts are absolutely priceless. He gives faith so that we may turn to Him and love Him and trust Him in all situations. He gives hope knowing that a greater day is coming. Knowing that He is moving and working and doing something incredible. That's what Advent's about. is hoping and longing knowing God is going to break through. And He gives love. What is there greater than the love that we have for God and He has for us? And the love that we have for each other. Would you trade all your silver and gold? Would you trade anything that you have riches for the love that God has for you and the love that you have for Him and the love that you have for each other? Amen? God is for you and He wants to bless you. He also wants to give us power. Power to witness. In the New Testament, the Bible says they were tended. Something was going on. They were hiding. And when the Holy Spirit came, they had power. 
They now have new strength and a new ability and a new infusion of power. God's greatest gift to His church is power to witness. Power to go out and proclaim the love of Christ. We are the body of Christ. This is it. We join with others who have put their faith in Christ. We are the body of Christ. This is it. The world is looking and waiting and longing for the body of Christ to touch them. And when God gives His good gifts, He gives power to the church. Pray for a great revival to give the church the power of the Holy Spirit so that we'll witness without reservation. Pastor, that's not politically correct. The Bible doesn't want us to be politically correct. The Bible wants us to be Christ-like. And it wants us to follow the mandate of Scripture and go into all the world and preach the gospel and teach them to obey everything that Christ has told us Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. This is what we are called to do, even if it's not politically correct. The church is to march on with the power of the Holy Spirit. And you know that that power, those weapons aren't weapons of carnality. Those weapons aren't weapons of the world. My father was telling me this week that as he was at Norfolk, and he had many invitations when he passed it in Hampton, and Norfolk is the largest Navy base in the world. He said, I was invited to go on. I was watching. They were building the, the USS Reagan. He said, you stood outside of that ship, Mark, and you looked up, and it's like you were looking at a skyscraper as high as that ship was. And the power of the ships and the power of our military, that's not the weapons that we have. The power that God gives us is to love your neighbor as yourself, to love the Lord with all of your heart. When someone strikes you on the right cheek, you turn to him your left cheek. You do not give back what someone gives to you. We are to absorb violence and live out the Christian life. Power to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Power to be witnesses in Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth. Leaving Naples and going out to where we live. Our neighbors, our friends, and people all over the world. That's the power. God wants to give us those gifts. He's not holding back. We are holding back. And I remind you, God is for you, and He wants to bless you. He wants your home to live in harmony. He wants the love of a husband and wife to just magnify and increase. And I mean nothing more than a bowl full of cherries. Amen? Pumpkin pod whipped cream. God loves His people. He wants your family content. He wants you loving Him and serving Him. He wants His church. He wants to bless the church. One of the great gifts we see that God has given us is the gift of unity, the gift of love here, and something that is genuine and real. That only comes from God. It's a gift from Him. The gift of a church growing and evangelizing and reaching the lost, that comes as a gift from God. He wants to give us those gifts because He loves us. Number four, God is for you and He will defend you. God is for you and He will defend you. Look at verse 33 in Romans 8. Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who is He that condemns? Christ Jesus who died. You see, the enemy will come around and will continually condemn us. As a Christian, you will often feel unchristian. Can I get an amen? amen. Satan will condemn you. <clears throat> look how you slipped up back there. I, I, look what you did. A Christian wouldn't do that. The things he says. He tries to condemn us and bring us down. and He wants to discourage us. And I'm reminding you that guess who will defend you? The Lord God Almighty. If God is for you, He will defend you. He will stand up on your behalf. He'll send angels. He'll send angels to defend you. There are places in Scripture where angels came and ministered. They're ministering spirits to come and revive and strengthen and defend. So I remind you, if God is for you, he will defend you. He is for you, and He will defend you. And then number five, God is for you, and He is praying for you. Look at verse 34. Christ Jesus who died, more than that, He was raised to life, 
is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Did you know Jesus is praying for you? God is for you, and through Christ, He is praying for you. If God is for us, who can be against us? You say, well, I have failed, and I've got reasons for failing, and I'm only human, and I don't think I can live for Christ, and this idea of being sanctified, and I don't know about being saved. All of this is only possible because Jesus is praying for you. Yes. He knows your name. I wonder if he knows what's going on at my workplace. He knows he's praying for you about your work. I wonder if he knows what's going on with my family. Jesus is praying for you about your family. I wonder if he knows about that bill I've got, the debt that I've got piling up on me, and the pressure that I feel. Jesus is praying for you. Christ is praying for you. You see, we make excuses. But if God be for us, who can be against us? If God be for us, Jesus is praying for us. Amen? Amen? Number six. God is for you, and He will never leave you. God is for you, and He will never leave you. You want to talk about somebody loyal. You will never find a more loyal friend than Jesus Christ. I know this will make you feel bad. I don't mean it that way. But you have let people down in your life. We all have. And people have let us down. And we regret that. When I let somebody down, I don't like that to you. Christ is the most loyal friend you will ever have. There will be times in life where you will say, I, I just know He let me down. He failed me. He left me. He left me alone. He left me out there in the middle of the battle and I got beat up and knocked down and look at me. No. Loyal? I don't know. I read a story recently. Roger Sims hitchhiking his way home would never forget the date, May 7th. His heavy suitcase made Roger tired. He was anxious to take off his army uniform once and for all. Flashing the hitchhiking sign of the oncoming car, the last hope, when he saw a black, sleek, new Cadillac. To his surprise, the car stopped. The passenger door opened. He ran toward the car, tossed his suitcase in the back, and thanked the handsome, well-dressed man as he slid into the front seat. Going home for keeps? Sure am, Roger responded. Well, you're in luck if you're going to Chicago. Not quite that far. Do you live in Chicago? I have a business there. My name is Hanover. After talking about many things, Roger, a Christian, felt a compulsion to witness to this man in his 50s, apparently a successful businessman, and he wanted to tell him about Christ. But he kept putting it off till he realized he was just 30 minutes from home, and it was now or never. So Roger cleared his throat, and he said the following. Mr. Hanover, I would like to talk to you about something very important. He then proceeded to explain the way of salvation, ultimately asking Mr. Hanover if he would like to receive Jesus Christ as his Savior. To Roger's astonishment, the Cadillac pulled over to the side of the road. Roger thought he was going to be ejected from the car, but the businessman bowed his head and received Christ as his Savior and then thanked Roger. This is the greatest thing that has ever happened to me, he said. Five years went by. Roger married, had a two-year-old boy and a business of his own. Packing his suitcase for a business trip to Chicago, he found a small white business card Hanover had given him five years before. In Chicago, he looked up Hanover Enterprises. A receptionist told him it was impossible to see Mr. Hanover. But he was able to get in and see him. A little confused as to what was going on, he was ushered into a lovely office and found himself facing a keen-eyed woman in her 50s. She extended her hand. You knew my husband? Roger told her how her husband had given him a ride when hitchhiking home after the war. Can you tell me when that was? It was May 7th, five years ago, the day I was discharged from the Army. 
Anything special about that day? Roger hesitated. Should he mention giving his witness? Since he had come so far, he might as well take the plunge. Mrs. Hanover, I explained the gospel to your husband. He pulled over to the side of the road. He wept against the steering wheel. He gave his life to Christ that very day. Explosive sobs shook her body. Getting a grip on herself, she sobbed. I had prayed for my husband's salvation for years. I believed God would save him. And, said Roger, where is your husband, Mrs. Hanover? He's dead, she wept, struggling with words. He was in a car crash after he let you out of the car. He never got home. You see, I thought God had not kept his promise. Sobbing uncontrollably, she added, I stopped living for God five years ago because I thought he had not kept his word. I remind you, congregation, that God is for you and he will never leave you and he is loyal and faithful. Amen? Amen. And then last, number seven, God is for you and he will deliver you. God is for you, and he will deliver you. I think of David that wrote many of the Psalms. He talked about times when his body was in anguish, and he was alone, and he was desperate. As a matter of fact, we have recorded in Psalm 22, the same psalm that Jesus was quoting from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David was out in times when he was convinced that he was forsaken and was lost and would be overtaken. The Bible is absolutely filled with stories where it looked like the story was going to be told of absolute and total defeat of God's people. As a matter of fact, often when they would disobey, God would allow an army to come against them. And they would struggle with that and try to learn from what he was teaching them. There are times in our lives that under God's permissive will, things happen. And those things can make us bitter and turn our hearts away from God. Or we can see that this is the very thing that God has allowed to happen to deliver me. Isn't that amazing? God is for you. And he will deliver you. And he always came to his people. Sometimes he uses human instruments for his delivery. Sometimes he'll use a great person, a great spiritual leader. We think back at our nation's history. We're so thankful for the founding fathers. And as they sat, signed the Declaration of Independence, and as they stood faithful and, and strong and, and wanted a great cause that came about to bring what we enjoy today. Amen? And men and women who serve in the military and faithfully give in all the areas of the armed forces so that we may live. They are part of God's instrument of delivery. But I also want you to know, God doesn't even have to have human instruments to bring about a delivery. God can do magnificent and powerful and wonderful things. And when He does, it's amazing. And I remind you, if God be for us, He will deliver us. He will deliver us. He is faithful. The scripture says again, if God be for us, who can be against us? If you agree, say amen. amen. Let's bow our heads for prayer. All heads bowed. We'll take just a moment. God is for you, and He desires to save you. Sometimes that means just save you from yourself. You're on a course, you're on a direction that is going to take you down. Christ wants to save you. God is for you and He wants to sanctify you. He wants you to surrender your entire body and soul to Him. Past, present, and future, the unknown bundle. He wants to set you apart for His service. A pure vessel bringing glory and honor to Him. God is for you and He wants to bless you. You may be in a season of your life that you think God is just hurling down upon you bad things. That's not true. God desires to bless you. 
greatest gifts, faith, hope, and love, the power that He wants to give you. Open up your heart to Him and receive His blessings. You may need God to defend you. You may be in the battle of your life. Let God do the defending. God is for you and He's praying for you. Jesus is at the right hand of the Father praying for you. He's praying for you right now as you're hearing the preaching of the Word. That your heart will be ready to receive and turn to Him. God is for you and He will never leave you. God is for you and He will deliver you. If God be for us, who can be against us? As we have our heads bowed, is there someone this morning that needs to trust God again and believe in Him being for you? You need to just put your faith in Him again. Maybe one of these areas that we have touched on, you need to trust Him again. If so, would you want to lift your hand to the Lord? Anyone? Yes. Anyone else? God is for me. Who can be against me? Yes. Anyone else? All hands bowed that would like to lift their hand to the Lord. Trust God in these areas. Yes. Yes. Yes, the Lord sees your hand. You can put your hands down. Father, forgive us for doubting you. Forgive us for not having faith in you like we should. Forgive us, God, for exchanging the glory of the immortal King of Kings for created things like gold and silver, houses and lands. Forgive us, God, for going through life busy, getting overwhelmed by things and not truly worshiping, tuning into you, trusting you. Help us again to be like little children and to know if my daddy's for me, my heavenly father is for me, who can be against me? Make us like little children, I pray, and know that when the enemy snarls and makes all kinds of noises and tries to threaten us down, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. If God be for us, who can be against us? We thank you for this resounding scripture. It doesn't stop there, Lord. It goes on to tell us that whatever may come our way, all the difficulties of life, it says that trouble, hardship, persecution, famine, nakedness, danger, or sword, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And now in closing is a benediction. I read this scripture. May it be a blessing to your soul. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. And all the people said together, Amen and Amen. God bless you. You are dismissed. We'll see you this evening.